Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Angelica Rubio, representative for District 35. And this is a uh, this is my town hall. And as you can see, I have a guest here, uh, my my pup Yoko, who is in desperate need of um, going outside. But unfortunately, that is not going to happen for the next hour. Um, but I am very happy to have you all here. Yoko, stop. Um, I'm really excited to have you all here for what is my second town hall for Pedaling for the People um, 2021. As you all know, I ride my bike every single year up to Santa Fe. Um, but unfortunately, because of the um, global pandemic that we're in, uh, COVID-19, I had to forfeit my ride and um, instead um, do the town halls virtually. Um, as, as I mentioned a little bit last night, uh, I am every single year that I would go up and do my town halls, um, I would stop in the communities along the way and have town halls with folks. And so it's one of the most um, fulfilling parts of my job is in, to serve in the legislature is to, to have these conversations with many of you all in person and I'm looking forward to the day that um, we can do that uh, once again. And so um, I want to thank you all for um, joining me tonight. Um, I actually just got off a call with uh, my caucus members, so folks who I serve with in the Democratic side of the legislature. And um, I have to say that it, um, as I'm working on this legis on these pieces of legislation and um doing all this work in preparation for the legislative session um Jen, in next week um there's also this the shadow looming over all of us in terms of what may or may not occur um on tuesday i've received a, a ton of notices from um my constituents and friends and family who are really concerned about what may or may occur um, the FBI, as you all have maybe read, have received numerous um, notices and reports about potential um, uh, issues that might arise uh, at every single state capitol uh, next week, um, particularly for us uh, as we convene up in Santa Fe. And so um, I know that that is very concerning. Uh, never in my time in the legislature, the last four years, did I ever think that um, this was going to be something that I had to worry about in terms of my own safety um, at the hands of, of cowards, really, who um, lost an election and um, are now upset about it. And so um, I am thankful to many of you who have reached out and all that we can do at this point is really trust the folks who are there to protect us, um, specifically the staff at the Roundhouse who are doing everything in their power to um, really um, keep us safe while we go up on the first day of the session. Um, and then of course our governor who um, I was fortunate enough to be on a call with today to speak to her on issues related to broadband um, and to know that she's working diligently as well as our leadership to make sure that everyone is safe, both elected staff and, um, and, and the public. Um, and so um, I just wanted to put that out there that uh, precautionary measures are being um, discussed and implemented in preparation for um, the 19th, which is next week. And, um, and so we can only um, really send good vibes that, um, that things go well for all of us. Um, with that said, I am here tonight to talk to you about a number of different issues. Um, one of which really the reason that I had selected the modernization of the legislature, um, the the a new economy for the state of New Mexico and and the issue around private prisons is because, um, as I mentioned to you all last night, there's a lot of the bills that I decided to carry this year, um, especially because we're limited to our five bills um, because of, of COVID nineteen and being on on Zoom um, for the for the rest of the session is that um, there's a story that needs to be told about where we are as a state. And 
since joining the legislature four years ago and now entering my fifth year, um, one of the things that I have um, really learned over the course of my time in the legislature is that one, we operate from a place of scarcity. Uh, there's never enough. Um, we're always um, proposing these really great ideas. A lot of the people that I work with, advocates on the ground, um, constantly coming up with these great ideas and the legislature constantly saying, well, there's no money, there's no money. And I think what we need to recognize, and, and this is the story that I have been wanting to tell for a really long time and am trying to tell is that we actually need to live, we need to actually live into, into this place in which live into abundance because we do have an abundance. We do have an abundance of natural resources and all of that, but we also have an abundance of ideas. And, um, and unfortunately those ideas have been squashed or suppressed by um, legislators <clears throat> and, and the folks who represent us because of the lack of imagination that, that we have. And so for me, the purpose for me serving in this New Mexico State Legislature is to work towards helping our communities unleash the, the ideas that, that do exist in our communities to not only um, create a new economy for New Mexico, one that serves our communities, one that is sustainable and that is not tied to extractive industries that are volatile and fluctuate every single year and that we can't even plan ahead. Um, and instead we're reacting every single year to try to respond to something that just happened. Um, we must work towards creating something that is sustainable, that is um, non-exploitative, which is why we're going to have this conversation around private prisons tonight, because um, historically in our state, we have been profiting off of either people's bodies, like private prisons, or off the backs of um, thousands upon thousands of workers who um, are making extractive industries very, very wealthy while leaving our families very dependent on these industries. And so it is our responsibility as legislators to provide an opportunity to provide a roadmap for what economic diversification looks like for the state. And my hope is, is that over the course of the next, what is it, 73 or 74 days that we are serving in this, in this legislature this week, this year, that, um, that some of the ideas that are moving, that are hopefully will move forward, um, will help to begin to address um, fundamentally the type of, of, of roadmap that I think we, we need to begin to have um, this long-term and also multi-generational plan to address these issues. Um, with that also is modernizing our legislature. Um, for many of you who do not know, uh, New Mexico is the only state in the country that does not pay its legislators. Um, we also don't have paid staff. We also um, don't have a lot of things to help support the work that we're doing. So this town hall that I'm providing to you all tonight and the numerous town halls that I do, the work that I do on social media, the preparing of, of, of legislative bills for the, the meetings that I host, things like that, um, or that I participate, I don't actually get a salary for that. I do a lot of that on my own time. And so um, with that, and there's the combination of the time that I spend um, getting paid to pay the, this, my, the place where I live, um, the shelter that I have, um, and so there is a direct correlation, in my opinion, between why we rank so low in so many different ways in comparison to the rest of the country, because we don't prioritize not only the fact that we don't pay our legislators, but that um, the people who are, representing are, who are representing us in the legislature don't actually have their, their values actually do not align with our communities. Um, the people who represent us in the legislature, many of them come from money who can afford to live to, to who can actually afford to serve, to, to do this. Many are retired, many are attorneys, many, um, can afford to take the, to, to take the 60 days off. But, um, imagine, um, a single mother, for example, who has 
this incredible depth of knowledge around navigating systems and trying to do the best for um, her children or single fathers who are trying to do the best for their children. Um, those are the types of people that should also be representing our communities and in many occasions cannot. And so when we're thinking about a new economy, when we're thinking about what we can become and what we can build, um, we actually need to prioritize who's actually representing us in order to get us to where we need to go. Um, and so first and foremost, um, I am in the process of finalizing my legislation um, to address issues related to economic diversification, as well as um, building a new economy for New Mexico. And that legislation is currently being drafted and there's a number of things that are that are taking shape. So um, as um, an organizer, I believe that uh, policies should come from the ground up. And I have been super grateful to be able to work with um, organizations from across the state who are not only addressing issues related to um, poverty and, and all the things that are really important to us, but they have taken um, the, the, they have taken some great steps in addressing issues related to climate and climate justice and really putting Black, Indigenous, and communities of color at the center of the, this work, specifically when it comes to workers who are um, in the process of, of, either, of either losing their jobs because of um, uh, industries leaving or because the industries just can't make their money here anymore um, because of whatever natural resource they've already exploited. And so, um, so much of there's, so there's a lot of efforts that have been made. And so the work that I've been doing is with Power for New Mexico, which is a coalition of organizations throughout the state who have really worked and prioritized climate justice work and seeing the environment through an environmental, the environmental work through environmental justice and through a racial lens and an economic lens and that in order for us to actually address issues around climate change, um, we actually have to do it from a place in which those who are directly impacted, people um, are impacted, trying to bring them to the table. And so in 2019, when the governor and others were championing um, a legislation around the Energy Transition Act, um, Power for New Mexico began to form and we're formulating many ideas on how to not only reach all of those um, goals that we wanted to reach um, to address climate in, in, in the Energy Transition Act, but it was also imperative to think about the workers who were going to be left behind if we didn't do something. Uh, the Energy Transition Act began to address a lot of those issues related to workforce development. Um, and so but that work didn't end in just 2019. There's work that has continued to build and that has been the work that we've been doing throughout the year of 2019 and throughout the year of 2020. Um, in 2019, we I carried legislation to uh, work on a workforce development um, study that was done under the Department of Workforce Solutions with the support of Secretary McCamley. And um, the study was done by the University of New Mexico and it was spearheaded by Power for New Mexico. I happened to find the money through um, some funds that we were able, that we were allocated during the 2019 session. And that study was just completed this past summer. And so that study has allowed us to, to work on a framework for what we're calling um, this just transition bill that we're currently working on. Um, but a lot has changed over the course of the last few months in that initially we were going to, we were trying to work it into another bill that was being um, created or that was being led by folks in, in leadership. Um, that legislation eventually did not take shape. So then we went at it alone again. And now there are opportunities for potentially blending some of our work around just transition into what is now being called a climate resilience bill. Um, for us, this is really important for, and when I say us is myself and, and the organizations who are doing this work around Power for New Mexico Coalition, because um, it's not just about, um, I mean, it's certainly about addressing 
uh, climate and, and all of that. Um, but, it's, but it's also having to think more in terms of um, how do we do, how do we address, how, how is it a both and where we're addressing issues related to climate and the, 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 how quickly things are moving to that we, we have to address these issues um, very, very much so. And how do we also work with um, communities on the ground who are being directly impacted? Because remember, especially for myself, as someone who was born and raised in the Permian Basin, the majority of my family is still employed by industry. Many are still working for oil and gas. And for us to say, let's end the industries tomorrow um, is not so simple because there are many, many families who rely on these industries for their, to put food on the table and to pay their bills. And so we have to be very thoughtful and methodical about how we do this um, except that there hasn't really been a plan. And so we can keep talking about economic diversification and we can keep saying that 40% um, of our budget is heavily reliant on oil and gas and we need to do something about it. There's a difference between actually talking about it and actually doing something about it. And so Power for New Mexico and these organizations that I have been working with um, for over the course of the last couple of years are really spearheading a lot of these issues and, and while we are encouraged by these ideas about redu reducing demands on fossil fuel and, and um, gas emissions and uh, uh, opportunities for resilience to adapt, um, we also have to be thinking about economic and workforce um, opportunities and um, economic diversification and climate resilience go hand in hand. They are siblings, they are things that should be coming together and that's how we should be looking at it here in New Mexico and so the legislation that I am hopefully going to propose and will be um, uh, will be um, filing soon for public consumption over the course of the next few days um, will hopefully begin to address a lot of these issues. Um, for folks who are super interested in, in all of this, I, I am happy to add the link um, on the um, I'll, I'm happy to add the link to my Facebook page. I can also share it um, in, in various spaces, but the workforce development study, which was conducted in um, through the workforce development, uh, Department of Workforce Solutions, um, that can be found publicly. That framework, our framework for the just transition comes from the over 1800 interviews that were done statewide by um, many who are directly impacted. And so I'm excited to share that information. Um, and so I, I really hope that, that you all take a look at it and also um, take, adv take advantage of the opportunity that we have in, in reaching out to your legislators and not only asking, um, but also demanding that not only do we work towards a roadmap for economic diversification, um, towards um, a green economy. A green economy is fine. I mean, I know people are super excited about wind turbines and things like that. That's great. Um, but for families who are living in the Permian Basin and in other places who are making a lot of money for their own livelihoods, um, we also have to recognize that the dollar for dollar is not the same in some of these green jobs. And so we have to think bigger beyond just a green economy. We have to be thinking about it in a green economy and sustainable and non-exploitative industries. And so these are really important thoughts that, that I have, that this coalition has. And so we're really looking forward to what's to come over the course of the next um, few weeks um, with introduction of the legislature, of the legislation. Um, in regards to, um, sorry, my dog's constantly wanting to eat my chair. So I have to like keep tabs. Um, the one thing that another, so the secondly, second, as we move into modernization of the legislature, um, I want to just address the fact that there are two potential pieces of legislation that we might introduce. And by we is myself and several other folks who are, um, interested in this issue. And, um, we are very much in in support of modernizing the legislature. So this doesn't necessarily mean just paying, um, paying legislators because sure that's important, 
Um, all of us need to be able to, to live to do this work, um, especially be 100% focused, laser focused on these issues. Um, but what's really important for us is to also provide um, to also have staff. So there's there's a number of different um, there's a number of different um, ideas that have come out of um, task forces that have studied this issue um, of modernization. And so we're just really carrying on this um, the work that's been done and handed um, to us by several legislative um, legislators from the past. There's amazing legislators from um, who have served in the legislature who spearheaded a lot of these issues. And, um, and so um, we're, we're not starting over. Um, uh, I think that's one thing to be that it's really important for folks to understand that myself and others who are who are working on this modernization of the legislature. This isn't new. There are there are a number of legislators over the course of the last few years who have really prioritize this issue. It's just a matter of political will. And my hope is, is that as COVID has really um, unveiled to us so many different inequities, my hope is, is that this is one of those inequities that exists that um, we need to have legislators who are representative of our communities serving in the legislature, um, not having people who are so disconnected from the realities of the people who are who are who are living into um, the policies that we pass on a day to day basis, um, and so I think for me that's critical. Um, there are two led pieces of legislation that I'm certainly considering, and my hope is is that we can um, make that change at some point. And um, so the two pieces of legislation, and it all depends on this upcoming legislature, as I mentioned, we are limited to five bills, but there's one piece of legislation that is a house joint resolution, which would be specifically to amend the constitution to remove um, per diem for legislators and replace it with whatever a council decides um, later on. One doesn't happen, before, the council happens before the actual, um, uh, amend, amending of the Constitution. So this would be several years along the way. Um, this wouldn't happen immediately and it would have to go to the voters first for that to happen. Um, we are still debating on whether or not a House Joint Resolution is the right time. It's if whether or not it's the right time, especially with all the challenges and the struggles that, that folks are facing right now because of COVID-19. And so what I am actually um, thinking about more and more is to go um, to, to address the second um, piece of legislation, which is a House bill to actually just create an administrative task force to actually um, work on all the ideas that have come forth in previous um, task forces and already just begin to implement a lot of these things. Um, legislative pay would eventually come to that. Um, that would have to be a constitutional amendment anyway. But there are other things that we could also be working on, in, including like issues related to interim committees. How do we how do we um, really capitalize and be more efficient during the year? For example, um, we can also work on um, issues like this coming this year. For example, we're being limited to five pieces of legislation. I actually think it's a great idea because it actually gets us to focus more on the what what we what we really need to what our purpose is for what needs to be addressed versus everybody getting to um, introduce up to 20, 30 pieces of legislation that may or may not ever make it anywhere. So um, there's a lot of the different ideas. I know that um, changing how often we meet as a legislature is really important. And so um, there's a lot of thoughts around, could we switch it up to like two 45 day sessions um, breaking it up one maybe in the springtime and then maybe in the fall and then having that way we can return back to our communities and, and in the middle and throughout the year so that we're constantly talking to our constituents that versus all the other things that um, we need to do. Um, I wanted to speak to something that someone has commented on um, and the question is Representative Abbas Akil who is unfortunately no longer part of our legislature. He served his two year term and decided to step away. 
um, because of the constraints. I also wanted to mention that uh, Representative Linda Trujillo, who was also an amazing legislator, much like uh, Representative Akil, both she had to actually resign her post last year because it was just impossible to do all of this legislative work um, and not and then having to work your day job and then still trying to be this champion that many of us are attempting to do as we're serving and um, and I think that this question that Mario brings up is important because Representative Akil, um, who was not only Muslim, but he was also the only Asian member of the legislature and had to retire after one term due to constraints of an unpaid legislature. He's just one of the countless talented legislators we have lost because of our system. Having an unpaid legislature didn't happen by accident. The moneyed interests, sorry to harp on our lobbyists again, that drive our state benefit greatly from having a part-time unpaid legislature because that gives them a huge institutional advantage in getting their goals met. Can you preview what the opposition to your modernization of the legislature efforts will be and how we, the public, can respond to those arguments? Um, Mario, thank you for that question. Um, there's a lot of things that can be done, I think, to address a lot of these issues. And it's important because um, we, um, as Mario has mentioned, um, there are a lot of uh, lobbyists are heavily involved in New, in, in New Mexico politics. I mean, I will say that the first time that I had orientation for the legislature um, and we did training, I was told once, like, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to a lobbyist because they'll be able to, to answer what you are asking. And I was just kind of blown away because it wasn't it was kind of like a like oh don't worry just ask a lobbyist and and they'll help you um to me that just said so much for me because it made me realize how um how um in, how i don't know to me it just breeds corruption like it's the fact that we are heavily reliant on lobbyists to help new legislators navigate the system to me is very, very problematic. And so um, it is very concerning. And um, and I do believe that there will be a number of people who oppose um, us modernizing the legislature. However, there are also a lot of folks who I think are just ready for it. I mean, the bottom line is, is that there's a lack of professionalism when it comes to our legislature. And I don't mean that individually within um, each individual legislature, legislator, I think everyone is doing the best that they can under the circumstances. I think the issue is mostly around the fact that we just don't have, um, like there's just so many things that we are just not capable of doing better for our communities. And so um, I think that some lobbyists potentially feel the same way because I think even while I don't believe all lobbyists are bad because there are some that are actually working really hard for this, the, 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 the special, in, the, not the special interest of like their, the industry that they work for, but there's, there are some lobbyists that are really working hard for um, people and communities, especially the advocates that are constantly going up to lobby. I think there's a level of, of, of efficiency that we need to be better at that if we were to take some of these um, um, these issues seriously and really start to to really transform uh, a lot of what we are, a lot of our system, then I think we could really, really make a difference. And so I think that's an, an important question. Um, I appreciate the question. Um, and it's one that I think will be um, important when the time comes that we're having these conversations. Um, my um, my recommendation is is that as um, if if so the question is if if we're able to introduce this legislation this year, it will be related to this task force that will hopefully work towards um, some of the ideas that have already been a part of conversations, um, and and that we will begin the journey of modernizing our legislature. Again, it won't happen overnight. This is something that I have to really reiterate to folks. I may actually never get to see the fruit of the labor of trying to get this done, 
But if it means that it's part of this process that will hopefully get us there, that there's folks that will serve beyond me or hopefully me. I mean, I don't, I don't expect to be one of those legislators that serves for like 30 years, but, um, and so I hope that people will, um, will be able to benefit from this work um, over time. And so um, that to me is really, really critical. Um, if there are no other questions, I'm not seeing any on my um, Facebook Live. Let me just double check here um, as I'm trying to um, do it all at the same time. Let me see. Trying to uh, do and it sorry. At the same time. Um, let me see real quick. If there's no other questions, um, one thing that I we can do, and I believe Nathan Craig is on. Nathan, I am going to promote you to panelist, um, and then we can start to begin the conversation around private prisons. If that is something that um, we can go ahead and move forward, and that way we have more time for questions, because I know um, there's a lot of questions related to private prisons here in New Mexico. Nathan. Um, and, and when you're available to um, undo your, your video, please feel free. But I just wanted to, um, I'll, I'll introduce Nathan when he comes on, but. It says, I, it says I can't. Okay, let me try, sorry. <laughs> this is why I need a paid staff. Let's see, um, I know I can do it here. So just give me one second, but. Um, one of the things that is really um, important and why I wanted to have this conversation around, um, uh, let's see. Okay, I'm not really sure why, so give me a second, Nathan, but I, let me just give an overview real quickly as to why I have requested for um, this private prison conversation to take place with economic diversification and um, the modernization of the legislature is that we are here in the state of New Mexico and, and I'll let Nathan speak to this um, more in detail because he's one of many who have been working on this private prison issue for a very long time. But um, one of the things, the, one of the reasons why I brought this issue here tonight to have this conversation is because it's an example of why New Mexico needs to stop investing in non-exploitative industries. Um, or we, we need unexploitative industries. Private prisons is essentially profiting off of our people, off of the bodies of our people. And, um, and I think that it's, it's critical for us to make that very, very clear um, that if we are going to diversify our economy, if we are going to um, make our economy more sustainable and less um, volatile, then we need to be addressing the, what I call the elephant in the room in that um, we need to stop exploiting our, we need to start doing, we need to stop doing it at the expense of our, of our people and our communities because um, private prisons right now, I think the biggest issue that we face is if we close down the prisons, then what will happen to the workers? And that is the biggest, um, one of the biggest, either the workers or the expense of the state taking over a prison. And then there's the issue around addressing restorative justice and uh, restorative or dealing, working on issues of, around reform and restorative re justice mm -hmm. to, to really work towards minimizing um, the, the prison population and actually making some true investments. So there's all this stuff. And so I'm glad Nathan that you're on. Um, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself. And in the meantime, I will work on your camera. Um, so if you can, Nathan, sort of give um, your introduction and also an overview of the work that you're doing, not necessarily just in specific to House Bill 40, but um, if you could just give us some context of like how we got here um, based on your own work with private prisons. Sure, thank you. So uh, I'll just start by my, my partner and I both uh, 
co-coordinate an organization called Advocate Visitors with Immigrants in Detention. And so we, we visit and spend time with people who are held in private incarceration facilities, which is a lot of what brought these matters to our attention. So I, I guess I'll, I want to start here by, by saying, you know, that, that depriving people of their liberty is, if the government's going to do this, it is an incredibly solemn function to be done in, in a free society. And, and this is not a function of government that should be contracted out to the lowest bidder. Unfortunately, we, we're in a situation in the United States incarcerates more people than any other country in the world. This, this trend began in the 70s and really accelerated in the 80s and the 90s. And New Mexico actually incarcerates more people per capita than the United States does as a whole. So we actually stand, the United States stands out in the world and then the state stands out within the United States. Within that context, New Mexico relies more heavily on private prisons to house people than any other state in the country. And, and has for quite some time. So this, this trend really began in the late 80s and accelerated into the, into the 90s of uh, under a, a sort of a neoliberal theory that the private sector would be able to fulfill this government role cheaper and more efficiently without the, without the bloat of big government. And under the, the pretense that it would the building these facilities would serve as a an economic development tool. And and what ended up happening over time is that as you, you open up more prisons and you end up filling more prisons, which is a process that's happened nationally and in the state. And we have private actors that make their money by depriving people of their liberty. And it operates as an economy of scale so that the more beds that are filled, hi, <laughs> the more beds that are filled, the more money the companies make. And so they have a, a very clear incentive to try to have as many people in their facilities as they can. In fact, they, they advertise, they, they described these facilities early in the 90s as hotels that the guests cannot check out of. And they've been behind things like truth and sentencing laws, three strikes you're out laws, various plans to try to ensure that people are, more people are incarcerated and they're held there longer. So after a couple of decades of this experiment, we can see now what some of the results are. We, we can see at the state that the facilities are not cheaper. They're not saving the state money. Um, there's a lot of pay that goes to the executives and their attorneys. And so they end up costing the state actually tens of millions of dollars more to hold people in private facilities. They are more dangerous. Um, studies show that there are more assaults, there are a higher number of weapons. So it's dangerous for the people who are held in the facilities and dangerous for the people who work there. Private prisons hold more release eligible people people who, who are supposed to be released but end up not being released because there's not a plan for how that's going to work and they end up being held there longer and these facilities have been fined for this. There's chronic understaffing. They don't pay as well. There aren't retirement plans um, and these facilities have been fined for this by the state for understaffing. So and then recently, they, they've turned out to be major public health disasters. They, private, some of the private facilities did not want to receive test kits from the Department of Health. Um, they, they concealed, and there were been a number of, of big outbreaks in the facilities and, and several people who have died in private facilities because of COVID. So uh, Representative Rubio has, has serve to offer to serve as a champion. We have a bill, House Bill 40, that's been pre-filed. And uh, we think this is a very important place to do this and a very important move to make. The way this bill works is it 
it creates a ban on the practice of, of, of having private. Let me back up just, New Mexico has seven facilities. It's a mixture. There's, uh, there's uh, Department of Corrections facilities, there's county facilities, there's ICE detention facilities, and there's US Marshals. So there's a, a, a mix of different kinds of facilities. And so solving this is a, is a kind of a complicated issue. So House Bill 40 creates a ban on the practice of private detention, and that addresses the federal facilities. Then existing contracts are allowed to expire, but they cannot be renewed or expanded and no new contracts will be permitted. And a lot of this is done through changes in corrections code. In addition, state government bodies like counties will be prohibited from taking money or getting paid from private detention contractors. So it ends the financial incentives to do this. Um, the way this will unfold is uh, the, tr the transition will occur over a period of two to five years until existing contracts are expired and then they can't be renewed. Um, in terms of the, the cost to the state in the first cost, there's, there's no cost for the first year and the transition pl plan is gonna occur over a period of time. So there's a, there's a, a buffer period in order to be able to develop plans that are unique to each facility and county about how to best address the the labor uh, transitions and the and piece, in some cases people to new facilities. So that's that's House Bill Forty. Yeah. No. Thank you, Nathan. And. Um, I, I want to just say to folks, Nathan and Margaret and others who have been a part of this process, um, it's, it's, it's been a very long haul. I know we've introduced this legislation, we've, uh, we've introduced similar legislation in the past, uh, mostly targeting just the ICE detention because of the issues that we have seen with um, many in our communities who have been targeted because of their immigration status and, and all of that. But over the course of this last year, we felt like we, it was necessary to begin to expand this um, idea of, of what really a moratorium and a ban on private prisons really could look like for New Mexico, especially because this is its birthplace in, in reality. And, and um, if you study what is happening with private prisons in New Mexico, you will learn that it is super complex. Um, there's, um, I mean, if I, <laughs> there's, there's, it's just, I, I was just having an image in my head of this meme that's very popular around um, uh, just the entanglement of how, like if you're following the money, it's just, it's just an, an, an incredible um, chaotic mess. And so um, it, this, this, this bill, this legislative bill, House Bill 40 is going to be a very heavy lift um, I am I'm confident that my colleagues in the House will be very supportive of this um, bill. Um, that is what I am hoping for. Um, but to answer one of the questions on Facebook Live right now in relations to how to virtually connect with legislators or the state legislature this year, um, I think this is an example of how critical um, the ongoing conversations that are going to be had um, for folks who've been following New Mexico politics for the last year or so or more, um, much has changed in, in, this, in, the, in terms of who is representing us. So the Senate, which has been a branch of government that has been considered heavily conservative, even with a Democratic majority, um, an outlook for this bill would have seemed dire. Um, in my opinion, um, we are now heading into this new legislative session where we have six or seven newly elected senators. Um, and while we, we, we don't know how they're going to vote or support, um, I think this is where that part of um, connecting with legislators is so critical is that um, this bill is, it's necessary for it to, to cross over the house. So we've introduced it in the house, it's House Bill 40. Um, we don't know yet until next week, which committees it will be assigned to, um, but it will be necessary to reach out to each of the committee members in which each of your important bills are being um, heard in 
and encourage your representative, the representatives in those committees to support or oppose whatever um, your, your bill is. In this case, we would hope that you would contact committee members, ask them to support this legislation. Um, and, and, I would, and, and of course, um, participate in, in public comment when it comes to um, committee hearings, which will be held via Zoom. Um, one thing that I didn't mention as I started off the town hall tonight, which I explained briefly last night, is that um, all of our um, committee and floor sessions will be held via Zoom. People can also call in by phone. Um, and um, the one thing, and, and they'll be held in the same way that the special session was held the last two times this last year. The difference though, and this is now in rule, is that if Zoom crashes for some reason, we also have to stop working. So we cannot, um, that was one thing that didn't occur this during the special session is that if things stopped working, we just were, we just kept going. And so we knew, uh, we did it knowing that um, Zoom was not available. That has changed for the, the session that's coming up um, next week. And so that's one of my, that would be my answer to you in terms of um, reaching out, connecting to legislators, um, virtually is is really try to utilize social media, um, email, call folks as much as you can. Um, I think also coordinating with as many um, organizations, for example, who are doing a lot of this work. I know, Nathan, with some of the work around private prisons, we've talked about the bill that I'm also introducing for Healthy Food Financing Act, for example, um, which I'll be sharing more about on Thursday night, is that there's such a direct correlation as well in terms of food deserts and our investments in private prisons. Like, I think people think that a lot of these issues are very much siloed, but they're not. They're, there's so much connectivity and intersection. And so I would recommend to folks who do a lot of lobbying and advocate, advocating from communities that one, I feel like this is an opportunity to be that much more engaged because you now have um, you can now see things from the from from your home versus having to drive all the way up to Santa Fe. In many cases here, in, in for us in Las Cruces, for especially for our immigrant families who are undocumented and don't have papers, like they can't actually cross to and go into Santa Fe. Like I think this is an opportunity for us to really um, maximize the importance of of virtual legislature because I feel like this is a really great opportunity to engage. Um, uh, there's another question, Nathan, around, is it also possible to ban contributions by private prisons to elected officials without jeopardizing free speech? That that's I think that's a, a constitutional civil rights question. I'd have to refer to my colleagues at the ACLU probably give a better answer. So I'm not sure this, this bill it would be nice if it did that, but that's not, it doesn't block uh, contributions, but it blocks the practice of, of housing people for money as a contract endeavor. Yeah. And it's important to actually um, spend a little bit of time on this question because um, as much like the issue that we face with oil and gas, um, the same can be said with private prisons. We, we, we tend, especially from, I'm a Democrat, um, of course, um, I lean pretty far to the left in many, in many cases. And um, I think folks that I work with on a number of issues, we tend, we have a tendency to say, oh, people who take money from private prisons or from the oil and gas industry, um, it's only Republicans that do that. Um, here in New Mexico, <laughs> that is not the case. Um, Democrats are generally the majority in both the House and the Senate, um, especially when we have trifectas that, and trifecta meaning the House, the Senate, and the governor's seat, that we have really bad habits as Democrats here in the state that not only take money from oil and gas, but also take money from private prisons. And so um, we cannot make transformational change until we challenge our own allies to actually be reflective of our values and, and, and making sure that um, they too do not compromise our values by also taking money from these industries. Um, the private prison industry is actually really smart as well in terms of how they send out 
checks to um, legislators. So I, I have to say that the first time that I received, um, it was, I had a check mailed to me from, um, uh, which one was it? I think it was um, a core, what, what is it? Uh, uh, core Civic? Core Civic, yeah, Core Civic sent me, I think like $250. And I right away knew because this is, I'm involved in this work, right? And so we mailed it back and we were like, hell no, we're not gonna take your money. Um, but there were a number of legislators who did accept the money. And, um, and the reason that they accepted it, I think in many cases is just that, like I do, I have, I do due diligence and I have a great treasurer that we always follow the money. Like every time someone sends a check, we double check to see who this person is or what this entity is. And if it's somebody that we don't necessarily align with, we'll, we'll send it back. Um, I don't think that's really calm. It's a really common practice in some, for some folks. And so um, I, I see that happening a lot too, but I certainly think it's, it's important that as we address this issue around private prisons, as we connect it to this economic diversification and working towards this new economy that works towards sustainability and non-exploitative industries, that we also challenge our, our leaders to, if we're really serious about economic diversification, that if we're really serious about um, treating communities with um, respect and, um, and, and with dignity, that we will no longer allow corporations to dictate who gets elected and who doesn't. And we do that by not taking any money from them. And so that's, that's where I stand on that issue. Um, Nathan, do you have any thoughts around, um, I know we just introduced, we pre-filed um, our bill. It's um, House Bill 40, folks can find it now and you can read it um, at the NM, if you go to www.nmleg.gov, you can scroll to me um, as the legislator and, um, and then the bill should be found under, under me or you can also just type in House Bill 40 and, and find the legislation there. Um, feel free to, to to comment and do whatever uh, uh, rela related to the to, to the legislation, and we hope we can we can certainly get your support. Um, we will be doing a ton of call a call to actions leading up to committee hearings, um, leading up to House floor sessions, um, and and so that's where the work will begin is in the on the House side. And so we encourage you that if you have a legislator um, on the House side. I mean, we all do, but so you, we really want you to begin to contact them and ask them to support um, the legislation um, for this uh, for this issue related to private prisons. Um, we have about seven minutes left. Um, I wanted to open it up for folks who have any questions either for the economic diversification piece, um, the modernization of the legislature or the private prison. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to pose at this time? Yeah, so we have one here, um, Dr. Harvey, thanks for joining us on this call. Um, he says, it seems like the timing for House Bill 40 has some positive aspects such as the election of Biden, the promise of immigration reform, which could include alternatives to detention and support for asylum seekers, and the decline in profitability of privately run detention centers. Angelica, do you sense that legislators are aware of the context has changed? aware of the context has changed and may weaken their counter arguments? Um, that's a really great question, Dr. Harvey. And um, I, I think that is probably one of the avenues that we will certainly be taking as we start to begin to do outreach. I know that um, some of the work that's been done already, um, a survey was done a couple of years ago um, by um, AFSME, which is the, I always forget what they stand for, but they represent state employees. And they're, they're certainly an ally of ours right now with this work. And they did a survey of all the house members, including the governor's office on whether or not they supported a ban on private prisons. They've been working on this issue in Nevada and in other places where they've seen a lot of success. And so um, 
they are certain back two years ago when folks were being surveyed, the majority of, of people did support the idea of, of no longer having private prisons in New Mexico. Um, the folks who were opposed to it, their, their opposition was mostly around, they, it needed to be a, a good bill, it needed to be a great bill, um, but it also needed to have sort of um, a, a plan on how we were going to address um, economic development, I guess, and workers and things like that. And so um, we have um, not had a clear indication from the House side that there will be strong opposition. Those conversations will begin to occur pretty quickly, pretty soon as the session starts. I guess the question then mostly is on the Senate side. We kind of have an idea of where folks stand on the House side. It's really the Senate that has been um, unclear. I know Senator Ortiz y Pino, Jerry Ortiz y Pino from, Santa, uh, from Albuquerque is um, helping us on the Senate side to carry this legislation. Um, it's still unclear whether or not we have, have an idea of what's happening there. Nathan, I don't know what your thoughts are in terms of what um, Dr. Harvey has, um, has spoke to. Should unmute myself. He he makes some very good points. I, I think the timing is is good. I, there there's a, and there's actually some additional pieces that that folks when they're when they're speaking to skeptical legislators might want to bring up, which is in 2016 the Obama administration uh, made a commitment to end the use of private contractors for for federal prisons, and the. Jeff Sessions and the Trump administration overturned that. My understanding is this is one of Biden's commitments that they want to reenact that ban on on federal contracting for private uh, prisons. And my understanding is one of the the what I know many advocates on the immigration side are strongly trying to encourage the Biden administration to part company with private contractors for immigration detention as well. And my understanding is this is something he's giving serious consideration to. So the, the time is ripe for the state to not rely on this as a source of, of revenue. For it's, it's really the revenue goes out of state. It goes to Tennessee where these, where, you know, companies are Utah, where these companies are located, but as a, as a source of jobs, which, they're not a good source of jobs. Um, they're they're going to go away, and we might as well ensure that at the state level that happens as well. Yeah, and to speak to that as well, I mean, I know that uh, President-elect Biden has been uh, is now on record. I think it was one of the debates where he said that um, he would have gone. I mean, whatever when as we many of us call Obama um, the deporter in chief, um, I think. President-elect Biden made comments during his debate saying that he actually didn't, it's as if he didn't have, he, I think he was pretty much saying, at least that's what I heard him say is that um, he wouldn't have done what Obama did. And so whether or not that's the, the thing he's gonna carry on into his administration is still to be determined. Um, but what I did wanna also say is that um, I think the question also is what are we going to do with the facilities if private prisons are um, no longer a part of New Mexico's story. I know I had a chance to speak to the Secretary of Corrections um, and um, Secretary Tafoya a few weeks back. She is very much um, in, in support of issues related to restorative justice and reforms within our criminal justice system. Um, much like many in our legislature, especially on the House side, every, there's a lot of folks wanting to reduce the population of folks who are incarcerated and really look at major reforms. And so there's sort of like this tension around how do we get all of that done? How do we move in that direction? Meanwhile, addressing this issue around these facilities and what to do with them and the cost to the state. And I think that's kind of the, the, the area in which we're going to really have to focus our advocacy efforts moving into the session is like, how do we um, provide the kind of comfort that I think legislators are gonna need, especially folks in the governor's office and others to know that we are not looking to end private prisons tomorrow. This is still gonna be about a three to five year process. And in that time, 
could we have some community um uh community like town halls and things like that as things start to minimize hopefully with covid to really get community um, um buy-in on on how do we really um transition out of this and again this is why this issue is so important to me but also in terms of why i put it into this conversation around economic diversification because it's it all is um, very much intertwined um, Nathan, we have just one more question from John on Facebook Live. How do you see the five-year results of House Bill 40? Fewer ICE detainees from national policy changes, reduced prison population sentences, more parolees, closure of some of the seven facilities. Um, that's a lot of different questions, or a lot of questions, but um, do you want, do you have any thoughts on that um, before answer, we wrap up? My, my hopeful answer is yes. Yeah. To all of those, <laughs> I'd like to, you know, I'd like to see fewer people incarcerated. I, I firmly believe that there's a tight link between having a profit motive to incarcerate people and the over incarceration that we have both in this country and in this state. And if we can, re, if we can start to take the profit motive out of it, we can start to work on other pieces of it as well. But I think that's, that's a, piece that has to happen early on. For the federal facilities, people will be moved out of state unless there's a ban at the federal level. At the state level, hopefully we'll have some, you know, 85% of people have mental health issues, 25% are nonviolent drug offenders that, you know, people, people who need medical care shouldn't be incarcerated yeah. is another piece of it. So I, well, I hope the answer is yes to all above. Yeah, absolutely. And just to answer to that question as well is that there, this private prison bill doesn't end all those issues, right? And we have to be very clear about that, that this is one tool for, to address a, the much bigger picture. And there are folks like Representative Momayestas up in Albuquerque and others um, who are working really hard to address a lot of these reforms, like how do we Take, how do we remove this, um, this pipeline to prison and really create opportunities for New Mexicans that doesn't result in prison? I know that we're working on a lot of drug reforms and um, issues related to mental health and things like that. And so this private prison bill is really to not only address the, 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 big, the, 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 the issues that we certainly have with just the industry itself, but I think it's also um us trying to rewrite the dark side of new mexico and we're trying to do this on a multitude of levels and which is why i'm really encouraged by the work that our legislature especially the my colleagues in the house who are thinking about things on a multi like we're multifaceted like we're not just thinking about this we're also thinking about a number of other, other things um, one last question we have from Nancy on Zoom. Beyond money, employee benefits, and issues like prolonging incarceration, are there other differences between state and private prisons? Yeah, there are. There are. One of the big ones is that uh, is that private prisons hold uh, lower custody individuals. The the state facility, the state holds both low, medium, and medium custody, but in, is entrusted with holding all high custody individuals. So the private facilities seek to hold people who are the least uh, risky of the, of the detained population. And these are the people who are gonna be the most likely, th th these are the people who are being over incarcerated. Those are the nonviolent drug offenders. Those are a lot of the people who really don't need to be, th there's no purpose for incarcerating them to begin with. Um, so yeah, that that's a big difference. They, they the the companies have carved out a, a niche to be able to hold those kinds. Another one is that they they hold the the facilities themselves are structured to have larger congregations of people, so that you have fewer staff members to the people who are in the facility, which is something that contributes to making them dangerous. Yeah. Well. Folks, we're out of time. It's nine. It's it's seven oh four. Um, Nathan, thank you so much for taking the time tonight to talk about House Bill Forty. We will be seeing each other very, very much. I'm sure over the course of the next few weeks. 
Um, and for folks who are watching, thank you so much for joining. Um, tomorrow, I'll be back with the third town hall um, and we will be discussing in the first half hour, we'll be discussing the um, housing modernization bill that I will be um, co-sponsoring with Representative Andrea Romero. And um, the second half of the hour, I will be joined by folks from CAFE, New Mexico CAFE, to talk about the paid sick leave bill that we pre-filed last week and I'm happy to share more about that. So if, um, please share the events um, with you all. Um, also, um, please visit um, popnm.org, which is P-O-P-P-N-M.org for more information on House Bill 40. And as well, you can continue to follow me on Facebook uh, at facebook.com slash RubioNM35 and on Twitter at Anna Rubio or on Instagram at Radically Rogue Rubio. So with that, you all, thank you so much. I'll see you tomorrow night. Please feel free to share the event and have folks register. Um, otherwise, you can tune in on Facebook Live um, tomorrow night at six o'clock. Thanks again, Nathan. I appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good one, all.